I'll start introducing myself. So my name's Rosemary. I'm very thankful to be speaking here today about a topic that's very close to my heart. About 10 years ago, my mom was diagnosed with terminal cancer. And in the flurry of all kinds of uh, medications and um, treatments and uh, chemotherapy and everything that followed then, we struggled as a family to juggle home care with careers and family and trying to spend some quality time with my mom. And before we knew it, those last four months were over. And we never really had a chance to talk about what that meant for us emotionally. Click or doesn't... Ah, yeah. Today we treat people much better and people live a lot longer medically with illnesses. But that also comes with a toll, physical tolls of um, things that happen to them during therapy, um, emotional tolls of having to understand what they're going through. And often um, the emotional side gets neglected. Either they don't have time for it, they don't have the opportunity to go to somebody and speak about it, or they're being protected. And that can leave these young folks, specifically also teenagers and young adults, feeling very lonely and very scared because they feel the pressure to be brave for their family. And a lot of times in this period where they're trying to form themselves and where they're trying to get um, a handle on their life and seeing what they want to do for the future, this is all taken away and everybody else is making decisions about everything except them. And so when they feel the pressure to be brave, they don't really reach out and it's really scary to talk about the emotional side of illness. But they do reach out in the native, native habitat online. And so we've conducted a bit of research to look at what do teens talk about when they have cancer, Lyme disease, diabetes, or other serious long-term illnesses. And we found that about half of their questions are medical, even though they are in treatments. And about a third of all the teens that are reaching out online talk about personal advice, like should I wear a wig to school or do I just brave it? Um, they also want to give back. They want to talk about their experience and help others. So they talk about how that, for example, the, the going on a trip, a school trip with diabetes worked for them and what, what happened and how they moved on from it. But generally we find that more than half of these conversations are really negative. Even if they're going, for example, in cancer, they're going into remission and actually find that they do have a life after all, which I didn't expect, the, the talks are really still very negative. And this is where we come in. We believe that People need tools to help them guide through that process. We're a small nonprofit organization, we're self-funded, and we want to provide tools for teens and young adults and, and children as well, obviously, um, to help them work through the hard stuff that comes them their way so that they can get emotionally stronger. We started with a book uh, which is now being used in over 200 hospitals in the US. It's a book that is based on narrative therapy and journaling because we believe that building your own narrative can help you build emotional strength and work through that hard stuff. We believe that young folks have a voice and they want to express that. And so we knew that after 35,000 copies that we were onto something, but we also knew we wanted to do more and we wanted to reach more teens. But how do you reach a teen audience that you know, doesn't read books anymore nowadays? So by the age of 21 in America, the average American will have played half the amount of hours of game as he does in school. So we decided if we wanted to reach a teen with a self-help tool, we needed to get them where they're at on their phones and playing games. So this is a short video about the game. just like we've been hit by this diagnosis, this illness. It makes me think of a black period, a dark period in your life, and you're at the edge of it. You want to get out of it, but you're not there yet. The quest of the player in the game is to bring Shadow's Edge back to life. He does that through journaling and through creative expression. Through the metaphor, really, of a city that's been somehow decimated or destroyed, you have the power to reconstruct it and reconstruct it both its beauty but also its meaning. The game is going to ask you some questions so that you can dig deep and understand what's going on inside. Do I really love myself? What do I want my doctors to know about me? And 
What am I not, what am I not saying? Shadow's Edge is like a person-centered therapy without the therapist, if you will. It's important to express yourself. You need a little more than just a distraction or a little bit more than medical medicine. It'll help you in so many ways, like more ways that you can possibly understand. So not only for the video, but also for the game, we decided to really, from day one, involve teens that had illnesses because we were building it for them. And I mean, quite frankly, who really knows sometimes what teens think. Um, so from the very first drawing of the first character, they really were not shying telling us what's hot and what's not and what worked for them. They worked with us for a period of over a year to actually get the game built and get it to a stage where we thought, okay, this is something that we now really want to share also with other people than just our test group. So we invited friends and families to join in. And as the, our patients started reaching out to their friends and to their families, we got some really good feedback from them also that it didn't only help the patients, but it also helped those around them work through what they're going through. Um, so also there, we, we knew something was, was going right, but was it really helping the kids build resilience, which is what we wanted to do? Was, were they really getting emotionally stronger? And, and how would we even know that? So we enlisted the help of a university in the Netherlands and Stanford's uh, Children's Hospital in the US. And we started figuring out how do you measure resilience? How do you measure being emp feeling empowered? And we found that these seven factors are what helps you really feel that you're more in control of your life and can handle more. And so we also put up a study together with the uh, with these two partners, so with Stanford and with the university in, in the Netherlands, and we decided to run our, our own impact study. Do, do you need me to go back? You can have the slides, I think, afterwards as well if you'd like. Um, so we conducted a study with 96 patients. Um, uh, unfortunately, of course, dealing with children that have chronic illnesses, we ended up with 55 five in the end that really did the three month period of playing 20 minutes a day. And we had a baseline study at the beginning. We asked them to fill out that same psychological baseline study at the end to see what the changes were. We then had the university and the hospital psychologists really measure that. Along the way, we also asked them to keep a daily diary of playing playing, how playing made them feel, uh, how long they played, um, af at which points they, they wanted to stop playing because it got too emotional, for example. Uh, we did spot interviews every month as well to talk to them. And we also asked them just questions about gameplay, basically, to figure out if the game was also fun, because of course, otherwise they wouldn't keep playing. And fortunately, we found that all seven uh, factors of resilience were impacted positively by it, but specifically, three factors stood out. So positive outlook on life or something, so optimism was something that was really largely impacted, as well as positive self-identity. We found that the players, through, these, through answering these questions, learned a lot about themselves and what they were really good at, which then helped them make decisions for what universities they wanted to go to or what, what else they wanted to do with their lives. And we also found that we had a large impact on emotional emotional regulation, so mood swings, um, being able to handle those better, knowing when they're coming. And in, in working with some of the therapists as well, we found that it was easier for them to regulate it in between therapy times. So the game helped prepare for that uh, psychological therapy that they had. But we also knew it was limited because it was a three-month study. It was only 55 participants. And frankly, if you want uh, hospitals and doctors to endorse you and to, to provide the game, recommend the game to players, um, to some of their patients, of course, that's a bit tricky because that's really not their natural habitat. We needed to get them out of the comfort zone and, and having them also play the game to, se to see what, it, what it's like and then be able to give that to the teens. And so we knew that just our impact impact study wasn't enough. So currently what we're doing is we're doing a full year academic and clinical study with one of the top 10 hospitals in the US, Alouri's Children's Hospital, and with the support of the Fenberg Institute, so the Northwestern University and the Osher Institute, uh, we are testing with 174 ca cancer patients between the ages of 16 and 24. And they are all in they're all going into remission. So they're in their last stages of cancer treatments. 
And what uh, Loris has found before the game is that um, these these kid, teens and young adults, they are especially prone to really mood swings, to emotional regulation issues, because they're, they now know that they're going into remission and they know that they have a life, but they really don't know what to do with it and if it's even worth it, because in the case of cancer, it could come back any time. Plus, there's long-lasting effects from chemotherapy, etc., where they're still in pain and depression is really high on their radar. And so that's one of the things that Lori really wants to look into. They also want to see if they can enhance um, empowerment, a feeling of control that these kids have an active role in their life and in their treatment. And then last but not least, uh, what we're going to do now for the first time, in the game you, you journal, you answer questions you, like you would in therapy basically. And for the first time with this group, we're also got starting to read and see what they journal about. So we're looking at, are there narratives that keep coming up? Are there similarities of what they're doing? And with the consent of the patients, they are then going to share that in, in groups. Um, the study started about two and a half months ago. And we can already see from first results um, that similar to what we did in our, our, um, our own impact study, that it is working and that there are changes happening even after two and a half months of, of playing. Um, but we still have a long way to go because we, uh, we decide for a clinical study in the US, you have to do at least one year and you have to see the long-term effects and we have to be published about it. We had to have um, psychologists involved really, of course. Um, so this is still a long story and it's quite early to talk here about it. But we're we're very uh, we're very positive and optimistic about it. So can a game heal a sick teen? Of course not, but it can help them understand themselves better, reflect, and see what works for them. It can help them take a little bit more of an active role in their illness, and it can help them reach out and communicate in a community that to feel like they're not alone and that there is uh, somebody out there just like them. So they can determine that their illness doesn't define them, but them they do. And that's uh, what we want to do in the future. We want to really look at building the community around the game and making sure that we help these teens find their voice and be able to, uh, in the long term, also help communicate and, and build that, uh, that support and get inspiration. So thank you very much for having me here. Then I'll leave you with some of the screenshots from our game that our teen players have, uh, have created in the game. Um, because it's not only about journaling, but it's also about artistic expression. And I'm here to take any questions you may have. Uh, so um, you, you made the game explicitly to help them, uh, essentially as a form of sort of let's say, mobile game therapy. Yeah, the yes. Um, did they know that the game was intended to help them? And do you think that that made it more or less effective? It's an excellent question. Uh, yes, we made it. We're not allowed to say it is a therapy because that's a two and a half year process still with the FDA, FDA that we're working on, part of which is why we need the studies. Um, but, uh, but we're allowed to call it a digital therapeutics because we've gone through the first round of, of testing. So this means that it can be used in conjunction with a therapy. So we've the, the players we picked mainly came through some of the hospitals that already were working with the book that we had. Um, and then we also recruited online um, and really specifically said we are looking to do uh, to conduct player research and what we need is um, teens between 16 and 24 young adults um, that have a form of chronic or serious illness. Um, we also had disabilities actually, uh, the people with disabilities that showed up or missing limbs or, or things like that. So they knew what they were getting into. Um, it did help us because we, we ran parallel tests with just players that had no illness. So we, we were able to see what the difference was and we did see that when they worked through it, they did it more diligently. So they really, they really tried it out to see if it could help them. Um, that means also that the answers that they gave us were very explicit. So we, 
from the first thing that we did in the game, we really changed a lot because it just wasn't working for them. Uh, as an example, in the game you have to uh, journal, you have to answer questions. They're quite tough questions. Um, it's questions that therapists have put together with us and they were saying, well, really they're not engaging. So even though I'm playing a game, it still feels like homework. And so we started rewording those, uh, those questions to make them more interesting and to, to really feed them into the story of the city more so that they made sense with the with the storyline of going through three phases to get the city rebuilt again. And we also, the other thing that they really wanted to do is get more rewards for the work that they were doing that were really visible and meant something to them. So everything in the game is like a metaphor. Every region, every area in the city has some form of meaning for your for yourself as a as a person. So there's, for example, there's a commercial district in which are all the questions that you answer uh, about other people and how they communicate with you. But also the the stages that you go through are the actual processing stages when dealing with grief, and the the, the questions are matched to those. And we also match the rewards to those. So in the first stage, um, as rewards you get, for example, you get plants growing back, you get animals returning, um, when lights will go in the windows, buildings will repair themselves after the storm, etc. But the animals are bugs at the beginning, and later on they're birds, and then they're cats and dogs, etc. So we really built it up according to what they are. And that, that, those were all suggestions that the kids made, not us. Sure. <laughs> So, do you think, so um, the reason I'm asking this is um, we've been talking a lot recently among my circle of developers about um, just how prevalent problems like depression are becoming, right? Mm -hmm. And I mean prevalent with the capital, oh, yeah. right? Um, do you think that what you've learned could be effective with players who don't know that it's intended to help them? Yeah. Um, and the reason being then, could we possibly take advantage of some of these, no, I'm not mm. asking if we can use your mm. research, uh, take advantage of some of these techniques to include them in everyday games, right? Mm. Like take advantage of some of what you've learned mm. to include moments of games that are essentially designed to help people come to terms with something that they're almost certainly dealing with without realizing. Another excellent question. Um, and, and you're welcome to research that we have, by the way. We will be publishing that online as well. I was joking yesterday at the networking event. I'm probably the only person in this whole event that is not looking to make money. <laughs> we're totally self-funded. We're non-profit. The game is free, will be free. There's no ads in it. Um, so it, it's it's really, you know, we're, we're, we just want to create the awareness that this is happening and that the emotional side gets neglected. And there's more often now, as you say, emotional connections because we also are dealing with a lot of stress in life. Uh, we have uh, about half of our players have, have ticked the box of having depression in the game. Um, so I think, yes, there's, um, to, to answer your question of could we do something in normal games as well, I think so. There, there's learning about um, what we ask the kids at the beginning and why we ask those questions while they're starting to play the game that I think might be, might be helpful, you know, to steer them in right directions. There is also things happening that we're now trying to look into like uh, um, having um, AI into our game to really target better what questions we give the, the, the kids that are playing according to where they're at and what kind of disease they have or how they even answer uh, questions that we give them. Um, and so I think there's there's a lot of um, a lot of research hopefully that'll come out of, of what we do with AI in the next two years that could also help with just general games for example. Um, and we think that this this tool also has a good opportunity to be used with others. Um, so in the game we have something we call Shadowgram, which is like an in-game Instagram where kids can can take a picture of their world and then share that with other players so they feel that they're not alone. And I think that is another component that a lot of games have where they have a social component of where uh, kids, um, you know, players actually communicate with each other. And that often is where things go wrong, right? Where there's bullying, where there's other things. So I think there's a lot of learning that we can have about how these in-game platforms of communications are built and how we monitor them, but more, more even better, how we focus on the community on monitoring themselves and trying to support others, I think.